Well, happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. I, I hope you got a dad's root beer. I've loved dad since I was a kid. I mean, you know, the root beer. And uh, anyhow, uh, and, and I loved my dad, so, you know, but anyhow, hope that you enjoy the dad's root beer. Uh, so, hey, listen, um, normally... Uh, on Father's Day, one of the things that we do uh, is that we uh, will wrap up our offering campaign that we do for uh, the Pregnancy Center. And um, as you may recall, uh, in this really special year we've been in, I use that word special really loosely, but uh, as you may recall, uh, we you know, really didn't have a, a, a regular assembly on uh, Mother's Day. And so what they decided to do is they would start it today on Father's Day and carry that through to July 19th. So um, we are starting a campaign in theory today, but I say in theory because uh, our uh, congregational representatives uh, are out of town, and so we don't have the baby bottles either. So uh, yeah, again, continuing this theme of it being a really special year, so next week, if you would, please do me the favor. There's going to be a table out there uh, for Obria and uh, a New Beginnings. And uh, if you would like to stop out there, get a baby bottle. But what you can do this week is you can prepare. You can be thinking and praying about what you'd like to do. And you could possibly even just like give them, you know, put the, the thing right in the bo baby bottle right then and there uh, and just turn it in if you wanted to early or whatever. But that's the plan. We're going to still do the baby bottles. We're just doing them starting next week, which I'm announcing this week. And then we're going to pick them up on July 19th and would really appreciate you doing that. I know that it's always, that's a huge part of their budget and how they function in the course of the year. I know it's a big blessing to them. Uh, most years we have uh, close to 100 bottles that we turn in as a congregation, and so I'd like to encourage you to please still do that, be a part of that. I know that uh, they have been busier than ever uh, here in uh, this season of people being shut in and, and trying to help people and take care of them. So let's uh, continue to lift up Obria and a new generation, and uh, let's uh, uh, continue to uh, support them. All right, well, if you would, let's uh, take a look at 2 Samuel chapter 5 today. Going to continue our series, Crowns Down. Excited to see all of you. Hope that you're having a really good weekend. You know, last week, I defined humility for this series as power under authority, meaning that real humility is not the lack of power, nor a lack of opportunity, or a lack of means to react or retaliate, but it's the use of that power, that opportunity, or that means, in other words, the intentional seeking of God's wisdom and direction to res respond in a way that either improves, brings understanding, or diffuses the offense to our pride. Now, one of the questions that was put to me this uh, past week is, uh, and the person didn't think so themselves, but they heard something said, and so they came to me and said, could it be construed what you said about all these things about humility and about David laying things down as advocating passivism? Uh, would, could someone get that from, your, from what you're saying? And so to be clear, you and I live in a fallen world, and I recognize that despite our most humble responses to people and situations, sometimes we are forced to defend or preserve life, limb, and or property. And I don't think that you and I can read the whole witness of the Bible, especially we're going to be right as we're going here through 2 Samuel and conclude that the Bible teaches pacifism. I just, I just don't think it's there. And I think that when we do some, when people sometimes will take the Old Testament and pit it against the words of Jesus in some places to argue that kind of thought process, that you're creating more theological and hermeneutical problems than you could ever solve. Here's the thing, is that the God of the Bible is unchanging. And the testimony of the New Testament is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God in the flesh, and that He's the same yesterday, 
today and forever. And so that abiding presence, that consistency that is there in whom God is, I just think whenever you try to pit things in the Bible one against another, that you are creating theological and hermeneutical problems for yourself that you can't solve, and that the reality is is that there are many responses of God to different situations, and we look at each situation in and of itself. So, that brings us to today's text. Now, here in 2 Samuel, I want you to keep in mind as we've been going through this series and as we continue to go this, through this series, that David is this iconic foreshadow of the Messiah, right? I mean, uh, when you look at those messianic passages, uh, most of them are in reference to the household of David. And there's lots that it's said about David as being that foreshadow and that his kingdom, his particular era of uh, and reign is the foreshadow of the kingdom of God. Now, it doesn't mean that everything that David did in his kingdom is is right on. We'll, we'll see where David gets rebuked and corrected, okay? And, and, but I, I just still want you to get the, the picture, though, that there's this foreshadowing that's done through the kingdom of David, through David's life and behavior. And so as we look at those things, as we go through this, we're going to point out the things that are in line with that foreshadowing. And, the, and then we're also going to look at the things that are contradictory to that and how God deals with that in those moments. But keep in mind that as David, as David is rising to power and his kingdom is expanding, that what we're seeing David do as, as a very uh, strong leader, as a very capable leader, as a decisive person, that David is following the blueprint laid out for Israel by God, going all the way back to the time of Moses. And in that process, listen, David often finds himself at war with his neighbors, rooting them out of Israel. And with them, their false gods, their idols, their pagan practices, so that, specifically, that Israel would be devoted to the Lord alone and have no other gods beside him. Now, fast forward to that, you know, to, to today. Uh, you and I, as we go through this passage, have to keep a couple of things in mind. One, you and I do not live in a theocracy or a monocultural monarchy. You and I live in a very pluralistic society, and so that means that uh, we can't just up and decide to do just what David did uh, as much as we might want to sometimes. But uh, listen, um, uh, uh, and, and I don't want us to put our trust in the sword, but I do want us to make note of these timeless principles. He's a hero king whose heart is after God and who governed in humility, and those lessons you and I want to learn. Now, here's the thing that we also are going to learn is, sadly, is that we go through this, we will see also the disintegration of, his, uh, of this king and his kingdom as he, moves great, as he moves more and more into pride and how it unraveled his legacy. So today we're going to talk about the power of humility in dealing with one's enemies. I think you're going to find this very instructive. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 5, whether it's in a paperback Bible, a leather-bound Bible, or your Bible app. Let's go there, 2 Samuel chapter 5. I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. Please follow along in whatever translation you have in your lap, because that one's my favorite translation. Let's take a look. 2 Samuel chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, and we read these words. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and flesh. In times past, when Saul was king over us, it was you who led out and brought in Israel. And the Lord said to you, You shall be shepherd of my people Israel, and you shall be prince over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And at Jerusalem, he reigned over all of Israel and Judah 33 years. And the king and his men went out to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who said to David, you will not come in here, but even the blind and lame will ward you off, thinking to themselves, David cannot come in here. 
Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. And David said on that day, whoever would strike the Jebusites, let him get up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind, who are hated by David's soul. Therefore it was said, the lame and the blind shall not come into the house. And David lived in the stronghold and called it the city of David. And David built the city all around from the Milo inward, and David became greater and greater, for Yahweh, the God of hosts, was with him. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messages to David and cedar trees, also carpenters and masons who built David a house. And David knew that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel." And David took concubines and wives from Jerusalem after he came from Hebron. More sons and daughters were born to David. And these are the names of those who were born to him in Jerusalem. Shamua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ibhar, Elishu, Elishua, Nepheg, Japhia, Elishama, Elaada, Elaphelet. And we only use like Nathan and Solomon out of all of those. But okay. And when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, and all the Philistines went up to search for David. But David heard of it and went down to the stronghold, and now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephraim, and David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. And David came to Baal Perazim, and David defeated them, and he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breaking flood. Therefore, the name of that place is called Baal Perazim, and the Philistines left their idols there, and David and his men carried them away. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread out in the valley of Rephraim, and David inquired of the Lord, and he said, You shall not go up. Go around to the rear and come up against them opposite the balsam trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the top of the trees, arouse yourself, for then Yahweh has gone before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. And David did as the Lord commanded, and he struck down the Philistines from Geba to Gazar. This is the word of God for the people of God. Blessed be the reading of God's holy word. All right. So, as we look at this chapter, here's the thing is that the chapter kind of breaks into two main segments. The first half of the chapter, uh, you know, uh, says things that will become explicit in the second half. In other words, the first half implies those things. The second half becomes more explicit in expressing those things. In the first half of the chapter, David is anointed king over all of Israel having served as king of Judah for seven years, and it is implied that David and Israel's covenant with God is why they decided to go to Jerusalem and to root out the Jebusites. It's not said specifically that that's why they go there, but it's implied. It says, look, he becomes king, and the anointing of the Lord is on them, and he's made a covenant with the Lord, he's made a covenant with these people, and then he goes to Jerusalem to deal with the Jebusites. Now, a little background story. The Jebusites. The Jebusites were Canaanites. Remember, remember this was originally called the land of Canaan, right? And the Father gave that land to them and, uh, t- and told them to root out all the Canaanites to get them and their depes- detestable practices out of the land and to be devoted, uh, everything to be devoted to the Lord. Now, these Jebusites were Canaanites, and Israel has failed multiple times to dislodge them from the land. Now, part of it is because Jerusalem is an amazing fortress of a city in that day, and so it's got high walls, uh, it's hard to get into, and David expresses that and explains, you know, in that, that the only way they're getting in is they're going to have to go in through the water shaft. There was water that flowed through the city to provide them with drinking water in case they were under siege. And they said, well, look what we can do is we can go through that water shaft and we'll just come up out of the water like Rambo or something and surprise them. You've seen Rambo, right? 
Anybody not seen Rambo? You just not seen Rambo? I guess I got to know my audience. Okay, a few people. All right. It's not like I'm recommending it or anything, but there's a scene. No, okay. Anyhow, uh, so my, my point is, is that uh, uh, they, they take the city by going in through the water shaft and are able to dislodge them. Now, one of the things that they say to David is, look, our city is such a great fortress that we could leave it in the hands of nothing but lame people and blind people, and you still couldn't defeat us. No one's getting in here. And that became like the watchword for them is, let's go in and wipe out the lame and the blind. Now, that does not mean, please do not hear in that, that that what David was saying is, I have a thing against lame people and blind people. That's not what he's saying. It, he's saying that he's using their own little phrase against them. He's, they've mocked him, and he's mocking them back. Okay, well, then obviously, you know, we're going to go in and take care of the lame and the blind. He's not talking about actually her harming lame and blind people. Okay, so there had been several attempts Joshua, going back, you know, Joshua attempted. Every attempt has failed. So then when it happens here so suddenly, watch this, David is anointed king. He makes a covenant with God. He makes a covenant with the people, and he takes the city. It's meant to draw us into a conclusion. Listen, the Lord God is with David, and he's with Israel in a way that he's never been with them before. Look at how successful, how quickly they came in and they took this city. I mean, there's just very little said. It's, it's, it's almost just like a kind of a segue, like, oh yeah, and by the way, he took Jerusalem. But there's more to it than that because we can go back through the history and find that what a sore spot this city had been. It's right in the middle of their territory. It's been a problem continually. Uh, uh, you know, it continues to be... A, problem today. But anyhow, uh, there's this whole situation developing there, and instead the picture is that very quickly they come in. Now take a look at verse 9. <clears throat> verse 9 says, and David lived in the stronghold and called it the city of David. Now there's all kinds of debate whether this city might be called, uh, actually have been called Jebu before that. There's other references to it being Jerusalem. Jerusalem, you know, basically being the city of peace, you know, where, where the peace of uh, Yahweh is. And so David takes over this city and he builds it up and it becomes this icon of what it means to hold Israel and to care for Israel and to be the leading city of all of Israel. It's important to you and I to pick up on that. What he's trying to drive home is that David has sought the Lord, and that's why he was able to be victorious. David has sought the Lord, and that's why he was able to reunite Israel. David has sought the Lord, and that's why the favor of God rests upon him. He only does what the Father is doing. Then verse 11, it's reiterated again. The king of Tyre offers David cedar to build himself a palace. Now understand, Tyre has been there the entire time. Tyre was, had beautiful forests and lots of cedar trees in the day of Saul. Did Tyre offer Saul wood to build his palaces? Did the king of Tyre ever make any effort to make peace with Saul? Nope. No, the implication is, is that Tyre even recognizes that there's something unique about the leadership of David, about the kingdom of God presence in the, in the leadership of David. And so he gives him wood as a peace offering between their kingdoms, further implying what? That David's blessed by God so much so that he not only conquers cities and not only is he loved by his own people, but he's even loved by the surrounding nations. He's even honored by the surrounding nations. Everything is implied here to say God's favor is absolutely on David in every way possible. You and I are supposed to read through that and go, wow, David's, David's the man. David's got it going on. God's on his side. Everybody's on his side. David is, is the example of what it looks like to be a man's man because David is a mighty warrior. 
David's also the same guy we're going to read next week that nearly danced out of his clothes. He wasn't afraid to express his heart for God. He writes most of the Psalms. Uh, I mean, uh, David is, is passionate. David is a warrior. And David most often has peace all around him because he's seeking after the heart of God. So then verse 12 says, And Yahweh established David. All of David's success is why? God. See, what, what the, the, the underlying message is, it's, it's not really David. It's God. God is the reason why David is so successful. God is the reason why David rises up from being a shepherd to being the king of Israel. God is the reason he's able to defeat his enemies. God is the reason that he is established the way he is. And why? Because of David's heart, because David humbled himself before God and because he had the heart of the Lord. That's the way David is described. Now, as soon as you and I begin to think about all of those things, you know, you and I can also run to all the mistakes that David made. If you've read through the Old Testament all, you know all, you know, there's, there's just an incredible list of blunders that David will make as we go through the rest of, the, the rest of the, this book in 2 Samuel. But I want you to understand that the way he established, the way he was established was by just humbling himself before the Lord and listening to the Lord. So here we go. We go into the second half of the chapter, and it moves from the implied, from the implicit to the explicit. De and, and so right there in verse 19, I love this, David in verse 19 gets ready to go deal with the fat Philistines, and listen what it doesn't say. It does not say, David, David does not say, bless my plans that I just made and go with me. Doesn't say that. It does not say, and God informed him of his intent to go up to, Philist to, to take on the Philistines. It doesn't say that. Instead, David responds to the intel that the Philistines are, getting re are seeking him to kill him. And David does what? He asks the Lord, what shall I do? Shall I attack them? Will you hand them over to me? Now, it is only when God promises him the victory that David decides to go with war with the Philistines. Look, David, at this point, he's, he's in the city of Jerusalem. He doesn't have to deal with this, but he's got the intel, and so he begins to seek the Lord. Lord, what are you doing? How are you handling this situation? How should I handle this situation in following your lead? He just wants to do what the Lord is doing, and if the Lord is with him, then he wants to go. And if the Lord's not with him, then he's not going to go do it, because why? Because the Lord isn't with him. I mean, that just becomes the defining whole thing of how David conducts his kingdom in the best of times, and then, listen, conversely, in the worst of times is where we'll watch that David stops doing that. When we, when, when we look at all the problems that will develop later on in his kingship, it will be that he stops listening for the voice of the Lord and then does whatever he wants to do, whatever he puts his hand to do, instead of listening to God in the moment. So David's responding to the intel, and in this process... He defeats the Philistines. Their gods, their idols are left on the battlefield. And he calls the place Baal Perizim. Now, the name Baal, first of all, you might recognize from one of the false gods. And that, that all sound is just uh, the, uh, from the Canaanite words, are just is a, the word for God. If you think uh, in terms of the word El in Hebrew or Elohim, being the plural of God, and that's the name that they often used for God, Elohim, but it's a plural sense of the word El, and so many times you see the word El in something in, in, for a Hebrew uh, word or what, whatever, and you know that El means God. Elohim is the plural of God. It means, uh, and so uh, when referring to our God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, He is referred to as Elohim, God's. 
He's referred to in the plural sense. It's, it's often referred to as what we call the plural of His majesty. Uh, and so there's this sense that God cannot be, all the other gods are El, they're just little gods, but God is Elohim. He is, he is a plural of majesty. He is more than one, and yet He is one. It's a singular name given to Him for the idea of Him being greater than any other god. So, he, he, he goes up against the Philistines and it says that they, they call that place Baal Perizim, meaning the idea that that's where the people left their Baal. That's where they left their little gods. That's where they left the gods of flies. That's where they left the gods that they created after their own images and stuff. And so here's the deal, that when people were going to war, they would want to bring their gods with them to bless them in war. Israel did something similar. They would get the Ark of the Covenant, put it on their shoulders, and then they would march the Ark of the Covenant forward in battle, and then they would come out uh, behind that. But it was to symbolize that God went before them into battle. So the other surrounding nations did something similar. They would bring out their idols, and they would set up their idols, and they would go to war. And usually their idols were things that were made out of precious things to them. And so they go out to battle, and whenever they were fleeing, he makes the point that they left their idols on the battlefield and ran away. And the picture for you and I is this, that their gods couldn't defend them. Their gods couldn't take care of them. In fact, their gods were so useless to them, it was better to abandon them than to try to pick them up and run away, which would weigh you down and get you killed. And so they left their gods on the battlefield. And David makes another mockery. He, he points out, he goes, look, he goes, we're going to call this place Baal Perizim because that's where they left their gods. And the, here's the thing is that it drives that point home to us so that we know what? Not that David defeated the Philistines, but that God defeated the false gods, that God defeated and that He gave them the victory. Then we go into verse 22, and there's another battle. They decide they want to come back for more. They say, well, that's just, you know, that just happens to be a, a bad situation. We're going to go right back up to the same valley. We're going to surround them. And this time, we're going to make a mockery of David. He made a mockery of us, but we're better prepared. We got a better battle plan. We got better, you know, we've, we've been, we're all prayed up. We spent a lot of time with our gods. We've slaughtered things and poked ourselves and danced around. And, and so now, now we're ready to go up against their one God, Yahweh. We've got multitude of gods. We got Dagon. We got all these gods on our side. And we've got a superior battle plan. And we've got a bigger army. Let's just go up. We're going to take care of David. And it says that David sought the Lord. And listen, the Lord literally gives him his field plans for battle. Don't you go up that way. What I want you to do is I want you to wait and I want you to go around this way and you're going to come up behind them and you're going to surprise them. They won't see it coming. David listens. David obeys God and it leads him to victory. Can I tell you, it would have been real easy in that moment for David to have said, and we've already whipped these guys once. Remember, I'm David. Remember what they sang about me? You know, Saul's killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands, right? I mean, can you, can you, if he just believed his own press, right? Oh, I, oh man, look, and I'm the guy, remember? I'm the guy who killed the tens of thousands of Philistines. I'm the guy who can take care of the Philistines. I'm the great king. Let's go out. Let's go to battle. And instead, what does he do? He says, no. He goes, let me, let me consult the Lord. It's not that I don't have superior firepower. It's not that I don't have, but listen, it's a clear picture of power under authority. David's humble. He's willing to follow God's lead, for which God then defeats his enemies and gives him the victory. Now, I know this part might seem obvious in a sense, but please notice that David and his men still had to do the fighting. They still had to engage. 
Sometimes we, we kind of do this, we kind of play it one or the other. It's either I'm doing something or God's doing something. And can I just point out to you over and over again that wherever we see the people of God, and get, that, that the people of God, they listen and they obey, they wait on the Lord, but then they have to act upon the things that the Lord gives them to do. It's not just a one or the other kind of thing. Uh, it's just like when you and I, if we want to grow in our relationship with God, we don't just say, oh God, make me know you more. And, and when we've been talking about this through this whole aspect of humility, that humility is not about just suddenly being, you know, fairy dusted by God, and, and then all of a sudden you and I are suddenly humble. Oh, I'm just, I'm so humble, you know. It's that you and I make decisions in spite of our pride to act in a way that is humble. We choose to listen to God first. We choose to try to, uh, de to deal with the situation and to address it, to diffuse, to do whatever is necessary uh, to fix the problem uh, instead of just responding out of our anger, just responding out of a desire to retaliate or to, make our, or to assuage our wounded pride. Look, everybody has pride on some level to some extent. Some of us more than others. I, I, I can just tell you, I grew up in a very prideful home, and it was encouraged to be prideful. And so one of the biggest battles in my walk with Christ, in t the entire time I've walked with Christ, is to walk in humility. And that's why this is such an important series to me, and why this is such an important subject to me, is that, listen, uh, what I know is that pride still raises its head, but then there's the decision about how am I going to respond? How am I going to handle that wounding to my pride, to that, that, that thing that has become an affront to me that, or, or whatever else, how am I going to tackle those things? Well, it begins with seeking the Lord and asking Him for wisdom and direction. Now, I, I will admit there are times when you don't have a whole lot of time to pray and consider. But hopefully if you and I are walking continually in this spirit of humility where we are seeking the Lord, seeking His favor, seeking His wisdom, seeking in His direction, that over time I'm less apt to respond, to retaliate in my pride and my flesh, and more apt to respond with humility even when I'm in the moment. But, can I, but anytime there is the opportunity for me to step back and to ask the Lord, look, look, it just, it never failed for David. Even when they were hunting him down, it was worth his while to stop, to pray, to listen, and then respond. It's not too late to respond. So that's what David does. <clears throat> now, David not only obeyed, but listen, David picked his battles based on how he prayed and took instruction from the Lord. Sometimes David actually had to swallow his pride and not go to battle. There are, a couple, there are several instances that we will see that where David, as he prayed and sought the Lord, knew that the answer wasn't to go to the battle in that moment. Now, I'm sure as a man of action, that was hard. Don't you think? I, I know whenever I, those things come to me, because I'm a person of action. I want to do something. I do not like waiting. And remember, I'm the guy I told you about. You know, I'm the guy that stands in front of the elevator and pushes the button. I'm the guy that stands in front of the microwave and goes, 30 seconds, come on! Come on! 29 seconds, come on! You know? And so I, I understand that it's hard. But David swallows his pride and says, Lord, I'm going to do what you said for me to do today. On the other hand, he stands in the ready whenever God says, let's go. And then David obeyed God when he got his instructions. And listen, one of the things I've discovered about humility, look, if you and I just went through those 39 verses that specifically pit humility and pride against one another, the majority of them say basically the same thing. We could do, you know, one message and cover it all. 
But the reality is that humility and pride don't usually manifest themselves just as humility and pride. And in this particular instance, what it's coming down to in many ways is self-control. Remember when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control? See, that manifestation of that fruit of the fruit of the Spirit, when the Holy Spirit is making His way through us instead of me just responding. Because remember, the same passage lists all the ways that we can respond in our flesh. You know, all the different ways that we can be carnal. And then, so in this particular instance, humility is demonstrated to us, not by saying, and David humbled himself before the Lord. It demonstrates itself to us and that we see him use self-control, seeking the Lord and only doing what the Lord gave him to do and nothing more. And sometimes, can I just tell you, sometimes the biggest battle in humility versus pride is doing that, right? I mean, in just choosing to follow the Lord and not to respond in the way that you feel in the moment. That's hard. Anybody who says this is easy stuff or that, you know, uh, Jesus is a wimp or what, like, I, I don't know what Bible you're reading because when I read my Bible and I try to walk these things out, they're, they're hard, right? It's a whole lot easier to just respond in the flesh. To that point, David strikes down the Philistines but listen, this is really important for you and I to pick up this part. As far as Gazar. As far as Gazar. Why that? Well, let me encourage you, just take a moment and scroll back in your Bibles to your maps if you've got a, a Bible that has maps. Or you could just pull up uh, uh, on your uh, Google search there or uh, your DuckDuckGo search, whatever kind of search you want to use, and you just look at a map there and you realize that that's a pretty short distance. It didn't even make it all the way across the territory uh, of Ephraim. He chases them a very short distance just to scatter them, to get them away from him, to get them out of the valley. Now, here's what I'm certain. I'm certain that David would have loved to have just wiped them out once and for all. I, I'm sure that David, it was absolutely in David's heart. And everything else I read, I just, I have no doubt that David would have done it had the Lord allowed him. But the implication continually is David just does what God gives him to do and nothing more. And that's why the Lord is with him. And so here's, here's the other part that you and I just have to remember. <clears throat> you know, when, when God sent the people of Israel into the land of Canaan and He so, said for them to root them out, and instead we see that where they just kind of dilly-dally around, they get busy doing other things, they, they, uh, sometimes they uh, even get captivated by the other gods and they fall away, and then we have to, that whole cycle of apostasy, you know, in the book of Joshua, when we preach through the book of Joshua, and, you know, faithfulness to unfaithfulness, faithfulness to unfaithfulness, round and round and round and round it goes. And, and listen, here's the thing, is that the God who stopped David, who was blessed by God, loved by God, in covenant with God, the reason that, da that David often gets stopped comes down to this, that God also loves the Philistines. Which if you're an Israelite, you can't imagine, right? I mean, it just, they're our enemies. They've sought uh, to destroy us. They, they worship false gods. They're, there's everything that we can find wrong about them. And yet, here's the thing is that this same David who becomes the iconic representation of the kingdom of God and of the Messiah, the Messiah who follows him in the covenant of David to be on his throne forever is the same Messiah who will make a way for Philistines like you and me. Why? Because... Here, here's the reality is that my 0.03% of uh, uh, 
you know, uh, Hebrew blood uh, doesn't qualify me. I, I come to the throne of Jesus not because of the first covenant, but because of the second. Because God had mercy on a Philistine like me. And sometimes that's really important for us to just to be able to step back and remember that when God doesn't do it the way we want to, that sometimes God has a plan for someone's life. God has a plan for their generations that we can't see, that we don't understand. Maybe that it's hard for us to fathom or believe. And so the mercies of God are poured out sometimes even in the most decisive moments of battle. And so one of the reasons that we need to wait on the Lord is we never know what God might be up to, even though in the moment it seems obvious to us. Because that moment, you want their head. In the moment, you want the pain to stop. In the moment, we want decisiveness. And But if we act without allowing God to have His way, if we react in our flesh, here's the thing that we see in the life of David, that eventually God will lift His hand of blessing off us if we don't follow His lead. Not because He stops loving us, but because we're using His blessings to destroy His plans. See, here's the thing. The key difference when we look at David versus like a Saul, both are mighty in battle, but David is blessed by God simply because he's willing to wait on the Lord. The one thing that Saul would never do. David focused his energy on seeking God for direction not trying to tell God what should happen. It doesn't mean he doesn't. Tell God how he feels. Because if you read the Psalms, you know David calls down a hellfire and a freezing rain on his enemies. It's just that at the end he says, but God, you have your way. See, that it always comes down to that David didn't lack the emotion or the passion or whatever else, but that he was trying to listen to the leadership of the Holy Spirit and do just what He was doing. Because the issues of pride and humility, church, are really never just about pride and humility. They're also about all those other human emotions that are at work, like patience, like self-control, like trusting God, like believing that God has His scope on the future that is much bigger than mine. If you'll think about it, one of the most basic elements of discipleship that we mention here as a church over and over and over again is learning to distinguish the Lord's voice from all the other voices in your head and around you and to look for what God is doing and then join Him in what He's doing. It really is that simple. Now, I didn't say that was easy. I said it was simple. Simple as in one, two, three, not easy as in just do like me, okay? Because I, I know that there are many times when I know the one, two, three, and I do something different. I'm sure nobody else has done that. So glad. So sometimes God leads us into battle. Sometimes God tells us to sit still. Other times God has them do something a little bit of both. <clears throat> and you and I, you and I are not the absolute monarchs or the rulers of a theocracy. And so we have to function within a society and laws and government that, you know, David didn't have to. Um, but listen, as you and I deal with our government and with all the chaos in our society and everything else, can I just implore to you that it's always appropriate that you and I humble ourselves before God and that we listen to His voice, and then we act 
as he leads us. When we do that, when we exercise the power we have under the authority of God, when we release God to do what he does and not try to make him do what we want him to do, listen, here's the thing. God in our humility, in our humble actions, releases greater power to us. And here's why. Because we can be trusted. Faithful in little, faithful in much. So we ask, we seek, we wait. But if we let our pride dictate our reaction, whether it's wounded pride or a challenge to our authority, challenges to our intellect, challenges to our position, challenges to our authority. If we act on our own because of sin, because of pride, then God must lift His hand from us because God knows the proud from afar. And I don't want that, and you don't want that. So we respond in humility in spite of our wounded pride, in spite of the challenges to our authority, in spite of the challenges to our intellect, in, st- in spite of the challenges to our position, in spite of the challenges to our authority. We give God the authority to step in, to give us direction, give us grace. Grace also is the same word that means power. Don't ever think that grace is just like, you know, God massaging you with oil gently or making you feel better. Grace, charis, the first meaning of that word is power. God gives grace, power to the humble, and then you and I work in conjunction with His power instead of working in the limits of our own power. David had a choice, didn't he? To go to battle in his own power or to go to battle in God's unlimited power. How many of you just want to go to battle in your own limited power. Hello? So, if you will humble yourself before God and do as He says, tackle life in the power of the Holy Spirit, just like King David did in his ascension, hopefully we won't end up like King David in his descension, or like King Saul, who literally had the kingdom stripped from his hands because he refused to wait on God and to listen and to do what God said. He had the kingdom in his hands. He was king of all Israel. David had not been anointed king until Saul refused to wait on the Lord and took matters into his own hands. And then the prophet of the Lord said to him, Because you've done this thing, because you would not wait on the Lord, the kingdom this day is ripped from your hands like you tore my garment when I turned away from you. I think it's a powerful moment for you and I to recognize that importance of waiting on Him. Because when we wait on Him, it leads to life and God's great blessings. Let's stand, shall we? Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning just hopefully in the attitude of King David, humbling ourselves before you, knowing that you are, you are very good, believing that every good and perfect gift is from you, not because we deserved it, because in fact the wages of sin is death, but, and, and no matter how hard we work for it, we know in the end we still need your mercy. We still need your good gifts because you are a good God who gives good rewards to his children. So we call heaven and earth as witnesses this day that we are choosing to walk in humility before you. We ask that when pride rears its ugly head in our hearts, that we would have the courage to bring our pride under your authority. We ask now, would you reveal to us those strongholds in our hearts, the prideful places in our hearts, so that we can root those out 
Would you give us revelation by the Holy Spirit so that we recognize pride when it shows up in our life and so we can choose, we can have the courage to choose what is right even in the heat of the moment. Would you be glorified in our lives and would you fill us with power from on high so that we can walk in humility. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you enjoyed worshiping with us. If you would like more info about any of the ministry opportunities or to stay connected, please visit myvineyard.church. If you're watching us on YouTube, stay up to date with us by subscribing and hitting the notification bell. You can also connect to us through Facebook or Instagram. 